So uh, thanks for having, having us here. Uh, we feel definitely embarrassed uh, to talk <laughs> after <laughs> Lucia Elias and Mark Hosint. And probably our presentation will look a bit superficial, maybe more like a comic, but uh, hopefully <laughs> interesting enough to follow. Um, we will talk about several subjects that have somehow that are somehow linked to Chrono Chaos, so to, so to the exhibition that we opened at last year, Architecture Biennale in 2010 in Venice. Uh, I will focus mostly on um, a specific aspect of Chrono Chaos in connection to a project that we are developing uh, in uh, Venice, uh, the transformation of the Fondaco dei Tedeschi. Uh, While well James will pick up another part of uh, research that is actually ongoing uh, uh, at the moment in our office, um, Chrono Chaos uh, tries somehow to solve, uh, try to put, declare somehow our officially our interest in preservation. The office has been uh, always involved since the very early years, since the 1970s. But uh, the first moment where, let's say, the body of research and work was uh, put into a system was exactly this exhibition, which tried to focus both through the presentation of our work, but also through the presentation of a uh, body of research, uh, the somehow contradictory aspects of preservation, or what we think are the contradictory aspects of preservation. Some of them have been already announced by Lucia Elias, actually. The main point that the, the exhibition tried to investigate was this increasing urge of preservation or interest for the past, we could say. We, through research, uh, we found out somehow that this uh, preservation is growing, both in terms of typology, so at the beginning we were preserving, our interest in the past was mostly focused in specific monuments, and then uh, through time, somehow, um, the specific object of preservation uh, increased in terms of typology. So we, at the end of this diagram, you could uh, read that the latest um, um, addition to the, for example, UNESCO World Heritage Sites includes even highways. Uh, oh, I can do it through my computer. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, how does it work? Like, uh, you can see... Um, highways or even cemeteries uh, or even department stores. Preservation is also increasing in scale. It's something that Lucia was talking about it. Um, so from the preservation of single monuments, we end up uh, uh, preserving um, urban districts. And in 2009, uh, they rushed, uh, just to make an example, the uh, rushed uh, ban in Switzerland was declared for its panoramic uh, um, qualities, let's say, and landscape qualities. Uh, a cultural landscape, that means that the um, railway itself and the buffer zone around was declared a uh, World Heritage Site by UNESCO, a total area of 109,000 uh, 109, uh, hectares, so quite wide. Um, as preservation is increasing both in scales and in typologies, uh, we also recorded a sort of proliferation of the organizations which are somehow linked to several preservation regimes. UNESCO is, of course, a very important body, uh, a very important institution, but of course there are like several other institutions which are working on the same topic, which have been, of course, increasing in terms of number through time. The diagram that shows instead uh, the, red and, uh, the red and white diagram instead is showing basically the increase of UNESCO sites uh, through times and the increase also of the uh, number of sites which are made, which makes uh, the uh, so-called tentative list. The list which is uh, submitted by every single country to the UNESCO in order to have specific sites um, listed by this organization. What is interesting about this graph is that while at the beginning, of course, the, um, the, the, the highest amount of, uh, um, the, let's say, the largest amount of monuments or UNESCO sites were concentrated in Europe, of course, as you proceed through time, the phenomenon is getting more and more global somehow. And uh, if you look, of course, at the tentative list, so the monuments that most likely will be listed uh, in the UNESCO, uh, by the UNESCO, somehow the phenomenon is even more global, or more, let's say, um, a, a global fact. Um, we s somehow tried to uh, quantify the area um, of Earth and uh, of the planet, which falls under any kind of preservation regime, and we came out to the conclusion that somehow uh, without 
mm, talking about very specific figures, an incredibly large amount of surface of the Earth falls under uh, the regime, any kind of or regime of preservation, whether UNESCO, whether local or national regimes. And that means somehow that the world can be understood in terms of a sort of split, a large area which is somehow um, immobilized because it cannot evolve, because it's declared uh, um, a heritage site. And of course, contrasting against a large area which is instead uh, calling for rapid uh, development. So somehow the world can be split in between these two categories at the moment. Um, uh, what is actually quite interesting is that uh, if you put together uh, somehow the, um, if, you, if you consider um, preservation as a sort of a, a globalizing, a globalizing phenomenon, the um, the uh, terms and definition of how a, a site can be declared, uh, can be listed by UNESCO, are getting more and more vague. So from very specific definitions, at the beginning, of course, of the first preservation acts, we come at the end with extremely vague definitions, which of course open up to the possibility to declare almost anything. The thing, the, what is interesting about this is that uh, preservation or the past in general can be considered a tool for development. The reason why the definitions are very vague is because may, more and more countries are entering the World Heritage Convention. Most, more and more developing countries are entering the World Heritage, the World Heritage Convention and uh, by having monuments listed in as, as UNESCO World Heritage Site, they have, of course, a sort of uh, benefit in terms of uh, touristic, uh, um, uh, touristic uh, um, um, visits, which, of course, makes uh, somehow the work of UNESCO extremely difficult. There is a sort of a political correctness uh, in the uh, process of selection of the sites. The, the sites now need to be equally spread uh, around the world in order to guarantee these sort of figures in many developing areas of the world. Um, the urge of preservation is also very explained, I think, uh, all, uh, by, by, by this graph, which is uh, very uh, well known for those who know the work of the office. Uh, it's basically, um, it's basically uh, talking about the, um, the, the time span between uh, the preserved and today is sort of shrinking in time. So at the beginning, we were uh, somehow preserving things which are, of course, very uh, ancient, and uh, through time, uh, through the several acts of preservation, we declare monuments and things which are closer and closer to us. So in a way, our sense of for the past has been altered through time, to the point that today we could think that preservation, in principle, could become a sort of uh, prospective practice as opposed to a retrospective practice. So we could decide in advance or at least this is a tendency, what could be preserved in the future in the very moment that we are building it or planning it to build it. This is something that is very clear that happens somehow to a very famous house from Rencola, the Maison Bordeaux, that only three years after completion was declared a national monument. Uh, it's a funny story somehow because uh, uh, the house was built around the platform, this moving platform, uh, of, um, you probably well know the story, of uh, the main client who was uh, basically living on a wheelchair. And uh, the platform was able to move uh, the main working space of the client through the house so that he could basically, uh, you know, like experience the all, all the levels of the house quite easily. At one point, unfortunately, the client died. So the very concept of uh, <coughs> the house somehow was not, the very reason why the house was built and designed in such a way was basically not there anymore. We were called, the office was called to readdress the problem, so to readdress the house, uh, to redesign the house, also to somehow, uh, it was a very sensitive manner, and somehow to um, uh, um, deal with this kind of very tragic loss of the family. And because the house was declared a national monument, the very architect who worked on the house, who designed it, was not able to change it. So the only thing that we could change was something very superficial. The platform was the office of the owner. We turned the office, so a place of work, rigor, into a leisure place. And we just replaced the desk with a pillow. Uh, the same pillow then was uh, um, shown at the Venice Architecture Biennale as part of our preservation strategies. Uh, and fortunately, it was used in a way in the same leisure, uh, with the same leisure attitude. Um, 
as you know, and it's been uh, it's been explained by Lucia, uh, the somehow the polemic with preservation traditionally can be um, can be um, defined by these two opposition, the authentic against the restored, that somehow developed a sort of schizophrenia of how to deal with the past, whether we should restore, whether we should basically keep things in their state and as ruins. What is actually what we observed, and then as architects, we are called to somehow to engage with this kind of processes very often while doing our designs, is that because of, uh, for example, the proximity of an historical area, Normal in many cities, uh, this is an American case, but in Europe it's very, very, uh, it's a very common case. You get somehow a set of uh, rules that you, basically the hacker should follow in order to maintain the sort of uh, historical sense uh, or unity of a compound. That means that this creates a sort of blur, a situation where you don't see exactly or you don't define what is new, what is old. In the end, a situation that can be defined as chrono chaotic. That's why the name chrono chaos. Or this is also a very famous slide of our research. It's representing, uh, um, it's representing uh, an American situation. Again, here history is somehow a farce. Again, uh, a chrono chaotic situation where the borders of the historical uh, tissue of the cities are maintained while the interiors are completely redefined as new. Uh, so the authenticity cannot really be evaluated anymore. Um, another case, preservation has side effects, sometimes uh, quite violent and unexpected. This is Gadamesh, a city where we have been asked to work. Well, actually, we've been asked to develop a, to develop a project around uh, the city, uh, so in the desert of Libya. <coughs> Gadamesh was declared um, UNESCO World Heritage Site in uh, 1986. Um, in the same moment, uh, um, Albert Speer Jr. That means the same from the same Speer, uh, the direct um, from the same Speer of uh, the Nazi time in Germany, uh, was asked to develop a new city close to the old one. As a consequence of the UNESCO World Heritage status, somehow this, the old city was not able to adapt to new uses, so it literally and gradually died out. And the new city, in fact, didn't nev never, never really accomplish to become a real city, probably because of this dichotomy between uh, the old and the new, which was never really accomplished. Uh, another case of uh, history as a fake, or the fake as history. And this is one of the contradictions that we've been experiencing a lot. Uh, all, let's say we, can, we listed several cases. This is uh, the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Basically, a totally non-authentic building declared UNESCO uh, monument, declared monument, or let's say a World Edge site by UNESCO in 1984, while uh, it's basically a sort of reproduction, not even following somehow the, exactly the original Gaudí's plan. So the great critique that is made to this process and in specifically to this choice is that, of course, there is a very strong collective uh, memory uh, that it, it can be identified, that somehow identifies the Sagrada Familia as a very important monument in Barcelona, but it's not really history. So if you think about history as a sort of linear way, this is a fake that is being declared a monument. So it's somehow a very strange situation. Uh, lately, or let's say from 2003, this uh, increase of typology of, of uh, let's say, things that are like, they, uh, that can be listed, as, that are preserved and that are listed officially as uh, World Heritage, uh, the, 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 mm, the things that are listed as, um, they can get the World Heritage status, uh, moved from the tangible, so actual physical matters, uh, to the intangibles. That means that UNESCO uh, uh, developed a list of uh, uh, traditions, uh, 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 languages uh, that are considered in danger, for which countries can apply their wor the, the, the World Heritage status and eventually, of course, getting it. For example, this is the list on the UNESCO website of <coughs> of um, languages that are in danger, but also very funny things are declared, or they get the word age status like acupuncture in, uh, in China, for example, or the Turkish oil wrestling in, uh, in, uh, in Turkey. So overall, a sort of a schizophrenic attitude towards whatever can be preserved, we have to preserve it. And of course, sometimes this is as the map that I was showing about the whole world with all the areas that are preserved. 
it's somehow uh, not allowing any kind of uh, progress or transformation which is necessary. Um, Venice, again, also applied for the World Heritage status of the handcraft of uh, gondolas, which are somehow uh, in crisis because of uh, several Chinese production. Um, but that's apparently the truth. So <laughs> Who made them in plastic, by the way, so not in wood, but... Um, um, in Venice, again, we are um, involved in a project, the restoration of the Fonda Cole Tedeschi, which for us is somehow quite new as in terms of experience to work on such an historical building, and uh, which is located in an amazing area behind the Rialto Bridge. It's, well, you see it, I guess. It's uh, enormously big compared to the, 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 the urban fabric of Venice. Um, before starting, let's say, uh, to work directly into the design, we looked at Venice, uh, Venice in general, where you can imagine there are like several layers of uh, preservation regimes that overlaps. So the UNESCO is really the last one, but uh, before UNESCO there is the national law that preserves Venice under a specific status. Then uh, another status is declared by the region of Veneto. Then another status is declared by the um, uh, province uh, of, Vene of Venice. And then the city itself has its own set of rules. That's somehow, this is for example an extract of uh, one of these pages of huge codes that we had to read and uh, understand in order to understand what we could actually do into the building that it's basically saying that we cannot do anything. Uh, so, no, but it's really like this, and actually this is a very serious subject because this led, of course, uh, to the total embalming of the city, which is a typical condition several of several historical cities uh, in Europe and in Italy especially. They, bec they become somehow platform for tourists or simulacrum. Basically, buildings are preserved. Of course, the laws have the great benefit to preserve this enormous heritage, this enormous architectural patrimony, but on the other hand, without, uh, um, without allowing any sort of transformation, cities become a sort of uh, instant scenographies. In Venice, this is actually extremely uh, impactful. If you look at them, this is what we were looking, so the effects of preservation, there's a huge decrease of uh, the curve of population. These are, it's only the 1950s, so we had almost uh, 175,000 people living there. By now, we are less than 60,000. So the decrease of population, so the decrease of vitality of real citizens living in the city is basically uh, super evident, especially if it's compared to the enormous rise of tourism, which led, of course, to the fact that the basically the city is uh, uh, doubled by people who come to Venice normally just to visit or to work daily and to a decrease of uh, urban function, even very, uh, you know, like very traditional urban functions, which are simply disappearing. Disappearing because uh, they are not supported by tourism as it's uh, managed at the moment, and disappearing because the former, the former basically basis of how the city was, uh, was functioning are not there anymore. So if 100 years ago, Venice and the population looks really, used to look really like a city, so with the actual markets going on, with the actual activities going on. Uh, 100 years later, it looks like this, you know, change for tourists and a mass of 20 million people looking around the buildings, not really entering to them, leaving uh, somehow a very ephemeral trace into the city. So not real citizen, not real city, which fuel, in a way, promote and generate an image of Venice which doesn't correspond to reality, not to the historical image. It corresponds to a sort of a re-engineered version. And for any one of you who walked around the cities of Venice, of Venice, you can imagine how much this sort of image is turned into a commercial item. And that's because somehow the city doesn't have any more content, real content to show, so real city functions. So, you know, like the mass, the sort of uh, um, general image. Uh, the way the city reacted to this situation, it's only through a proliferation of museums. So a city that is already turned into a museum, overall, uh, allowed during the last years, during the last 30 years, only other museums to grow, real institutions, which is of course a very important thing. Uh, uh, Venice is the mother of all biennials, biennials, but on the other hand, it's not what a city only needs. And that's why when we were asked to look at the Fondaco, 
uh, and the fund is promoted by private investors in collaboration with the city, so it's a sort of public-private partnership, we were asked essentially to define the program. So if it's not a museum, what it could be, considering that you have that kind of situations in terms of decreasing population, massive tourism, etc. Uh, the Fondo Co is, of course, in a very crucial point of the city. It's a sort of involuntary background. It, uh, also for tourists who take pictures you know, from the Ponte Rialto, they don't even know what it is. Um, it used to be a trading place. It used to be the place where uh, German merchants were uh, sleeping, living and making trades uh, since uh, the 13th century in Venice. And this was uh, the kind of structure, a courtyard structure, which was also replicated in other three buildings, the Fondok of the Turkish and the Fondok of the Greeks, which allowed foreign merchants to come to Venice, do their trades, without uh, fearing any danger, even when the Serenissima, so the Republic, was actually quarreling with their original, um, um, with their original uh, places. Uh, in the 1940s, the Fondaco became, after uh, being custom office, after being trading place and custom office uh, for under Napoleon, it became a post office after a, a massive uh, fascist renovation. Today, it looks like this. It's been abandoned. Basically, this sort of, um, it's a sort of empty bulk of uh, the glorious mercantile area. The post office has been, uh, the role of post office has decreased through times. At the moment, it's abandoned. What is interesting is that you can see here that even this building is basically abandoned. So the Fondoc is one of these many buildings which have not been able to be readapted because there have been already many investors trying to do something inside. Uh, but the strict preservation regimes basically kill any sort of uh, potential transformation. So the possibility also to reactivate such an urban fabric of these dimensions with this kind of uh, collective importance in the city has uh, somehow disappeared because of a very, very narrow-minded view of, uh, um, of uh, preservation in the city. Uh, it looks like this on the inside. So there is a beautiful courtyard and the beautiful galerias around the courtyard, and inside these are the leftovers of the post office. Um, while this is basically what uh, it's closing the courtyard on the top. Uh, you see here some more images. <coughs> so it's been occupied through a very mediocre use, and this was already when the building was abandoned. It's abandoned now since almost two years. Uh, again, we were asked to think about the program. The client wanted this. So a sort of, again, a touristic facility supported by a very few commercial, uh, very, very few commercial program, very little commercial program. We decided instead to develop or to somehow refresh, uh, in, in a way, the, uh, the, the, um, the secular tradition of a trading, trading spot, trading place. So we proposed to turn into a department store, which seems obscene, if you think about it, because of course the city has been commercialized completely, but department store is in fact a, a city function and very deliberate injection of a modern function into a city which doesn't have these kind of programs. A department store in a modern way, so where people can go, stay, not necessarily buy. And what we thought about this is that it was kind of keeping the unity that through the different adaptation uh, somehow the, 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 the Fondaco uh, used a, a, as um, passed through during, uh, through his history. So something like this, in a way. This is the image that we try to convey to the city when we were trying to think about the new program. Uh, when a department store is of course more than just uh, a place where you can, you can buy, but uh, as I said, it will be run, it will be run by a sort of um, public-private partnership in such a way that its spaces will be partially commercial, and by commercial it's the red, and partially run in cooperation with the city, so to host the public events, to host public program, and that's the blue. That means the courtyard, the top, and the galleries will be a sort of hybrid between uh, commercial and uh, public and, and let's say more event related activities or public program. Um, again, we had to confront this. Having chosen, of course, uh, the department store as a sort of, uh, as a sort of uh, outcome in terms of program, we had to understand what we could do and the department store as, you know, has to respect specific rules in order to function and uh, which of course were very, very important to implement. So we looked at the history of the Fondaco. 
And the history of the Fondaco is actually quite interesting because uh, you saw through the timeline, very short timeline uh, from before, that it's been somehow readapted several times. So every time you see a red uh, text here, it means that the, the building has been somehow changed quite drastically through its several consecutive uh, adaptation through times. Uh, so here it's few slides. For example, this is a slide from the 18th century, still with the uh, Giorgione and Tiziano frescoes on facades, which uh, were actually was a really new experiment in Venice to use artists to de decorate the facades. And uh, you see here the differences. So the corner towers were demolished, uh, the frescoes of course were gone, and uh, some of the chimneys were completely destroyed. And even if you look at the historical plans here and here, Somehow, the historical plans from, six, from the 16th century, it's been completely and radically changed with the plan that we finally found. So, in a way, authenticity was not anymore an issue. So what we questioned to the city was, okay, but if you have a building that has been going through so much transformation, why we cannot keep on transforming it? These especially are pictures from the massive 1930 transformation where the building was literally rebuilt from the inside. So you could say that from at least 60% of the fabric, it's not original. It's been remade in the 1930s by fascist engineers. So what is interesting about this is that while only 80 years ago we were thinking able to operate in such a drastic way, now, of course, we lost completely this kind of attitude. And these are some images of, uh, again, the, um, the after transformation of the 1940s with the concrete beams, so even the roof is not completely authentic. The Fondaco was part of this re-editing uh, that uh, was presented at the Biennale and uh, in fact we called the concept that we wanted to implement for this project preservation of change in order to somehow promote this idea that it could evolve through a different adaptation to a following use. In the image that you see here, basically it was a grid of uh, 27 projects, some of them never considered preservation before that we somehow re-edited through also rewriting the text of a project which were from the 1970s uh, under a new light, so under the light of uh, preservation, or in a way in relationship of the relationship with the context or historical fabrics they were dealing with. Uh, what we do for the Fondaco somehow is to, uh, again, adapting uh, its use to uh, the new department store. So this is how it looked in the historical fabric, and this is how it will look. We have to make it more permeable, so we open two new entrances uh, from the two main uh, public routes. Uh, one is, of course, from the Rialto Bridge, the other one is from a place, a, a square called Campo San Bartolomeo. And what we do is actually just uh, reopening uh, the entrances which were used for goods when the Fondaco was a trading place, so we have a sort of historical connection with this. Uh, this is the plan, so with the two new entrances, uh, where of course the most traumatic element is the insertion of an escalator, obscene to a certain point, under a certain point of view. It's basically uh, the functional element that makes, will make or should make the department store work properly, but of course it's been, uh, let's say, an object of a great discussion with the municipality, with the heritage advisors and so on. We just claim that, of course, none of this culture is real, so why not inserting a technical element which is necessary? So it's not a question of design, it's necessary for the functioning of the program. This is how it will look like. We have a, basically a RAM, which is uh, um, landing in, in the middle of the culture, then another set that you see through this uh, huge uh, circular opening, and then another ramp which is now, now hidden in this uh, picture which, il which will lead uh, to the top floor. What uh, we try to quote, this is a quote from Carlos Scarpa in a way, uh, so one of the representatives of the people, let's say the, the golden school of architects in Italy where in the 50s, the 60s and the 70s were able to really establish a, a fluid dynamic, the dynamism between old and new. And uh, all the law that I show, all the, the extras from the laws have been declared after these architects uh, finished to somehow operate. So in 1970s, uh, it, uh, this kind of a season of uh, operation between uh, old and new in Italy, which had some very great, great examples uh, through these people, uh, somehow at one point stopped. Now, I mentioned before that the courtyard is, um, is um, a public space, will be a public space, which of course uh, can be questioned by the presence of the 
of the escalator. So what we do is that we are experimenting with the first operable escalator in the world, which will allow, for example, to liberate the courtyard, almost like a medieval uh, uh, bridge, in order to organize what the city plans to organize within, uh, within, uh, within the Fondaco. Maybe in, in uh, maybe somehow uh, um, coinciding with some of the main events of the city, like the Venice uh, Film Festival. Um, in general, what we do at the commercial floors is something very simple. We really adapt. So the top floor, we really readapt uh, very little of the original fabric. Sorry. Uh, so besides the insertion of the escalators, we only re uh, we keep the typology of uh, enfilade, which is which you see here. Sorry, uh, we just open a bit uh, the, spa the, the the partition between the, the rooms. We liberate the corners that are normally used to be in the original condition the main uh, apartments of the most important German merchants uh, in uh, the 16th century. And uh, what we liked about this scheme is that, of course, this is just a diagram. You see some of the technical elements which are inserted uh, within, the, within the building, is that it's totally different from a standard department store where the claims for open space. So we actually think that the program, in a very creative way, can be challenged by using small spaces and creating some sort of wunderkammer of somehow uh, shopping or, or commerce or in between. That could lead, for example, to have also intimate views uh, to, the, uh, to, uh, to the Rialto bridge and to the Rialto panorama. So the idea is somehow that instead of having an open floor which is completely commercial, we just uh, create a different situation, different pockets of programs. Uh, to our astonishment, when we finished to calculate all these things, we somehow try quantify the degree of artificiality that we were introducing into the building. And uh, with the conclusion that almost 65% of it was completely untouched. So even such a strong transformation uh, didn't uh, change uh, excessively the building, or definitely less from what was made, for example, uh, 70 years before by uh, the um, fastest renovation. One thing that we didn't touch, except for the big opening of the hall, uh, the show that shows and makes visible the escalator, is this wall. And what we liked about this was, what we liked especially about the Fondaco was somehow this sort of feeling of solitudes around. And of course, uh, almost like a monastery, so very different from any kind of department store. Um, of course, this kind of uh, crashes with any idea of uh, uh, you know, brand over visibility. Brands are based and base their kind of communication on uh, transparent surfaces. And uh, this looks quite difficult in a way to achieve through this thick wall. So in a way, we also investigated very minimal strategies using the doors, almost like a very domestic, uh, very domestic operation. But then somehow uh, refreshing the, uh, the idea that the Fondaco was covered by frescoes. This is a fragment of, uh, um, of uh, it, which was in the Fondaco, which is stored now in, uh, in a museum in Venice, in Cadoro. We sort of think that maybe we could regenerate our own frescoes. These are, of course, our proposals, are quite obscene, and, uh, and uh, then mixes somehow some fashion elements with the previous graphics, old graphics. And the idea was to communicate the brands through the walls by refreshing the tradition of frescoes, when the frescoes could be basically talking about the brand and talking about Venice at the same time. So a sort of a virtual visibility through a very old technique. The major intervention that we do is basically uh, the second major intervention besides uh, the escalator is uh, it's, uh, concentrated in the roof. The tradition of roof terraces in Venice is related to World War I bombardment. So it's when, if you walk through Venice, you find all of these structures here. They were actually originally placed there in order to... Yes, I'm almost finished. <laughs> Uh, in order to somehow uh, counter-attack um, um, planes and bombarding planes. What we do is actually quite uh, simple. We take out one side of the roof, we open a terrace, and we modify the center pavilion, which was also um, added uh, later on at the beginning of the 20th century. So the resulting condition is basically this, a new space, quite big, available for anyone, of course, a tourist or citizens of Venice, and able to look into somehow this uh, um, very powerful panorama. Uh, the central pavilion is actually quite interesting. It's uh, basically a sort of hat, 
what we do, which is not accessible at the moment, so it's really like a just a, it's really just covering the courtyard. What we do is just we lift it up, 1.5 meters, adding a sort of new set of structure, making this set basically this uh, sort of uh, pavilion available for anything that can be programmed inside. So these are just visuals that uh, talks about this kind of uh, idea of unlocking the, poten the potential of some of these spaces. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, maybe some kind of secret meeting could happen there during the Biennales. But uh, um, again, uh, and this, of course, we expect the terrace to be a very hot spot in Venice. Um, what we try to do is, of course, by just removing one side of the terrace, in fact, this kind of intervention, which is actually becoming an attractor, of course, in the city, I mean, the roof terrace will be an attractor in the city, it's, in fact, quite subtle. So we do it without really traumatizing neither the profile, neither the structure of the building, but somehow that's a new floor. It's a new space that, of course, Venice was lacking. Finish for me. Well. So uh, a big part of our preservation exhibition at the Venice Biennale was the black hole. And this was our name for architecture of the 50s, 60s, and 70s that demonstrated a kind of social ambition or a political ambition which is now um, not tolerated and in danger of demolition everywhere. For example, the Palace de Republic uh, represents an ideology that's totally discredited now, so therefore the architecture is also discredited and demolished. Uh, this is a global phenomenon which we tried to make an inventory of. And uh, it also relates to uh, the figure of the architect um, and how that's evolved today. So he's no longer an anonymous uh, technician working for the greater social good on um, collective housing projects. He's merely a star architect. So one of the things we looked at was uh, Kisho Kurokawa's capsule tower in Tokyo uh, to try to measure the durability of the materials. Mm -hmm. And um, unsurprisingly, we found out that uh, their lifespan is uh, becoming shorter and shorter as they become more modern. So uh, this stimulated us to look in more detail at, at the movement of metabolism as not only as the last avant-garde architectural movement, um, but also a moment where architects were kind of uh, public heroes. And uh, this is now culminated in a book that's 720 pages and is going to be released uh, well, the first copies are coming back next week, we hope. Uh, these are the metabolists. They're a, a complete diverse mixture of um, young architects. There was um, a Marxist, a feudalist, um, graphic designers, architects, uh, industrial designers. And uh, they contained arguably the first architects and others who completely uh, uh, avoided the limelight. Uh, they were an avant-garde movement that was uh, motivated not only by visions of the future, but by an obsession with Japanese history. This is the Isa Shrine, which is um, renewed, uh, totally dismantled and totally rebuilt every 30 years. So it's always old and always new at the same time. And they took this as the motif for a new architectural movement that could do the same thing. Uh, this is how alteration usually happens in Japan, um, one of the biggest earthquakes ever. So uh, all of these, uh, the historical cultural influences and Japan's permanent vulnerability um, kind of gave them a faith that architecture must be impermanent from now on. And that was only confirmed after Hiroshima. A lot of the metabolists witnessed this directly or visited immediately afterwards. And uh, they also participated in master plans to rebuild uh, Japan's destroyed cities as their student projects, as they were coming of age. And, and this was the founding uh, statement of their movement, the extinction of architecture. It can't be permanent anymore. Um, at the same time, there was, uh, as well as the pressures and influences of uh, Japanese tradition, there's the pressures of uh, rapid modernization. In the 60s, Japan was undergoing the economic miracle, and uh, Tokyo's population, after a dramatic dip towards the end of the war, is now growing to 10 million. So they needed a new kind of architecture that could accommodate this change. 
uh, Izazaki, who actually wasn't a metabolist, but he was a collaborate, collaborator with them. He had a solution for the urban mess of Tokyo, which was to simply straddle it and uh, ignore it totally. He also was wrestling with archaic building regulations. So I'm now going to focus on uh, uh, metabolism, which has been uh, a victim of the black hole, and then I'm going to move on to two specific examples. So I'll move quickly through these. Uh, Yamagata, Hawaii Dreamland, which was realized in 1967, uh, when the craze for leisure was um, breaking out in Japan, and uh, this was for people who couldn't actually afford to go to Hawaii. That lasted less than 10 years. Uh, Kikutaki and a kind of uh, civic project, which is typical of a lot of the projects of the time, had this uh, great civic spirit to it. It was now, uh, it's only still standing because a school agrees to use it as an auditorium, whereas uh, the people who lived in the town wanted to destroy it. Uh, Kikutaki's Expo Tower, which was this triumphant uh, viewing platform for Expo 70, was dismantled not so long ago. Uh, Kikutaki's Capsule Tower for Sony was uh, demolished in 2006. And uh, another one of uh, Kikutaki's dreams was also demolished in 2007, a building that looked exactly like a tree. So now to, to talk about two examples. Um, the first is the Sky House by Kikutaki, which has been altered beyond recognition, but has survived as, as an exact uh, result of that alteration. So here it is. Um, it's raised 6.6 six, uh, 6 .6 meters in the air, and um, it was the, arguably the birthplace of the metabolism movement. In the space liberated underneath the building, uh, the housewarming party, Kenzo Tanga, who you see here, uh, took aside his uh, right-hand man, and ordered, them to, ordered him to gather an architectural movement, which became metabolism in 1960, when they released their manifesto. And they uh, published it and announced themselves at the 1960 World Design Conference in Tokyo. And then, uh, several decades later, Rem Koolhaas and hans Ulrich Obris show up at Sky House to interview its architect. And uh, what they found there was e extremely surprising. Again, it's uh, the avant-garde that's obsessed with the past and that uh, is motivated not only by progressive ideas of democracy, but actually uh, Kikutaki is a feudalist. We noticed in his alcove that he had portraits of, of his uh, grandparents who were famous landowners in Kyushu. And uh, the American occupying army after the war confiscated this land. So uh, Kikutaki had a resentment and he saw the ground of Japan as being fundamentally corrupted by this new regime. So this is another, uh, another founding principle of metabolism. It's not only about renewal, it's not only about capsules. What we found is that it's about an obsession with the idea of ground and creating a new surface on which to build. Um, probably sounds less strange in Japanese, we think. It was also um, motivated maybe by the first example of aristocratic architecture in Japan, a yayoi granary house, which was uh, emerged at the same time as agriculture emerged um, to keep the grain dry and uh, lifted off the ground. So underneath the house, um, it opened up a space not only for parties like the ones where metabolism was founded, but also for Kikutaki's architecture office. So it allowed for great flexibility. And uh, inside this office, they started to work on the first major alteration to the house, which is the addition of a capsule underneath. And uh, in this capsule, uh, Kikutaki, the family's new child, would uh, be stored. Uh, this was the, the realization for Kikutaki of uh, an earlier project, but on a more domestic scale, uh, where the insertion of a new capsule, or move net, as he called it, would be a, a, a social ritual and a, and a great celebration. So here it is, added in 1962, the move net. Uh, the child inside in his very cramped quarters. And uh, a few decades later, Kikutaki showed some regret at making his son grow up in this tiny little room. Um, this is the history of alteration of Sky House. You can see that it's uh, been uh, altered kind of beyond recognition. 
And then uh, when we went there again in 2009 to photograph it, we realized that it's actually no longer a sky house. The underside, the patio has been filled in completely, ironically by the exact son who uh, grew up there. It's as if his uh, capsule has expanded and he's taking revenge upon his father. So uh, this used to happen under there, but now this happens under there. And uh, figuring out the new configuration of the house was uh, very difficult for Ren. Uh, now the second example of uh, uh, another iconic metabolist project where actually no alteration happened and now as a result the fate of the building is uh, really in doubt. It's uh, Kurokawa's capsule tower which is in Ginza, which is a nightlife district in Tokyo and it fitted in uh, almost perfectly to the surroundings in 1972 when it was completed. Um, Kurokawa himself was the ideal inhabitant of this building. He identified a new kind of human being called a homo maven, moven, which is a human being who doesn't really live anywhere but flows between different capsules from a car uh, to an aeroplane to a hotel to a bar, uh, sometimes to his office. And the capsule was supposed to be uh, extremely temporary. It was supposed to be uh, renewed, a uh, new one plugged in every 25 years but this didn't happen and the results have been pretty catastrophic. Inside the capsule, uh, architecture merges with equipment. So the homo moven goes in there and, and in a way plugs himself into uh, all uh, new technology and new medium. Uh, but Kurokawa does give us some comfort that we don't actually have to transform into cyborgs in order to inhabit it. Again, several decades later, Rem and Hans Ulrich show up to interview the architect of this building to get to the bottom of it. Um, Kurokawa was, uh, worked his whole life to expand the realms of architecture and to work in media and politics as well. So in the year of his death, 2007, was actually really terrible. He, lost, he ran for the governorship of Tokyo and lost dramatically, receiving only 3% of the vote. And his uh, masterpiece, was slated for demolition. Um, it had a pixelated ownership, which means that uh, every owner of a pixel had a vote of um, what should be the future of the building, and they voted for demolition. And ironically, this was the same problem um, for Tokyo as a whole, and which is the reason why no major master plan has ever been able to happen there, because the government can't expropriate enough land because ownership is pixelated. Uh, the capsules were even in danger of falling off, we found out. And then uh, two years later, the international campaign to save the building began. Uh, Nikolai Urasov went there and, and found a pretty horrific scene. Nothing short of a full-scale full restoration would save it. Um, and then he also identified the, what we called the black hole. Post-war buildings, unrespected. The problem is that in Japan, only buildings over 50 years old can be uh, considered for legislation that would protect them. And uh, Capsule Tower doesn't qualify for this yet. So here it is, um, nearly 40 years later, uh, much grayer than it was. Pixelated, uh, here's one of the pixelated people inside in one of the perfectly preserved capsules, still using the original appliances. Uh, we found evidence of the leaks, which formed a kind of mosaic of informal alteration. Some of the capsules have had their original equipment gutted and um, more uh, temporary and personalized equipment installed in its place. Uh, up on the roof, the extent of the decay becomes really clear. The top of the capsule is uh, wearing out. I've only got two minutes left, I know. Uh, <laughs> More informal alteration for the sake of privacy. Uh, more degradation, uh, some informal spontaneous usage that we found. Uh, Kurokawa was already campaigning to save the building in the year of his death. He made a short film about it. Um, the capsules should have been replaced in 1997. And the reason they weren't is because uh, the development company that owned the building, which is called Nakajin, uh, was already bust. So there was no kind of vehicle for raising money and uh, that would pay for the insertion of new capsules. But that's exactly what he's proposing now. He wants to buy back capsules individually from the he American hedge fund, which now owns the building, and then uh, replace them. And when, it, when they do, it will be much cheaper, 
and the building would last 200 years. But in the meantime, you can still uh, buy a capsule, mm -hmm. even though the realtor admits that uh, the building may disappear at any second and your capsule will leak. So maybe it's better to rent one. And I just want to end with uh, an incident in Kurokawa's youth where he had a much more gung-ho attitude towards alteration and permanence. He designed a building that would have dynamite embedded in it from the beginning. <laughs> so the building itself was a time bomb and uh, all these questions of alteration and permanence uh, wouldn't have to trouble the next generation. Thanks. Okay, thank you.